Hi guys and welcome to today's lesson which is dealing with sketching the graphs of y equals a sine n open bracket t plus or minus epsilon close bracket and y equals a cos n open bracket t plus or minus epsilon that's a long title okay but actually all it's talking about is transforming sine and cosine curves yay yay yay, yay. the excitement is unending Having already dealt with what a sine curve and a cosine curve looks like and all the other chapters where we've transformed things, hopefully you already now have a working understanding of the fact that we can dilate, reflect, and translate functions. This is equally true of sine, cosine, and tangent graphs. And I know we haven't done tangent graphs yet. We're coming to it, but it, it doesn't matter. We've been looking at the idea of what the amplitude is. So when we have a sketch of a graph, if we just draw the standard sine curve, we know the amplitude is actually one. It's the difference between the mean line and the maximum, or in fact, the mean line and the minimum, okay? Or it's halfway between the maximum and minimum point, you sort of know. And the period is the distance between successive repeats of the function. Like we do with all other graphs, it's important to know what changes when you dilate, reflect, or translate. So as I say here, when you've got amplitude changes, that will happen when you dilate away from the x-axis, right? Because amplitude is effectively changing your range, you're looking at transformations away from the x-axis. Your period will change with dilations from the y-axis. When you reflect, there is no change to amplitude or period on its own, okay? So there's no change when you reflect and likewise, when you translate, if it's on its own, that will not change the period and it will not change the amplitude, right? So it's useful to know these type of things. But obviously, once you start combining them all, everything sort of goes to pot. So here are some examples of graphs that are written in this format here. And it's really, really important to see that it's written in that format. So I actually say these are great looking functions. Why? Well, basically, the x has a coefficient of 1. Inside that bracket, the x has a coefficient of 1. Or when there's not a bracket, I don't really care what the coefficient is because I can go straight to things, right? Looking at this graph here, I know the amplitude is 3. I'm really happy with that. I know that there is a dilation. Factor 1 third away from the y-axis, right? That's, that's this value here, that's that 3. And I know there is a translation of pi on 4 that way, right, to the left. Love it. Really, really happy. Here, if I look at my dilations, what do I have? I've got factor 2 from the y-axis. Uh, sorry, I do this every single time. From the x-axis, I've got a dilation, a factor a third, from the y-axis. How did I know it's a third? Because that three is inside the cosine bit and as such is the opposite of what I'm expecting. I know it's got a reflection. How do I know it's got a reflection? Because it's got a minus sign. There's a reflection in the x-axis. And I know there's translation of pi on three that way. Just by reading it. This one, a lot, lot easier. I've got a dilation factor three vertically and I've got a dilation uh, going to move in that way, factor one third. So much easier than all the others. Now, it's unlikely that you'll get a nice, wonderful question in an exam that's not there to trick you. You've got to see the tips and tricks. And in this situation, I notice that the x no longer has a coefficient of one. I have to factorize out that three, and I get it as four sine three x plus, and I'm going to divide that by 3, which is times it by a third, pi on 6. Now that it's in that format, I can see my amplitude is 4. I can see that my period will actually be multiplied by a factor of 3, uh, sorry, a third. And I can see that actually it's going to move that way, pi on 6. Likewise with this example here, my t does not have a coefficient of 1. So I would need to factorize that out to go on 2 cos 4 t minus, and then multiply that a quarter, 3 pi on 8. Now, again, looking at it in this form, I can see what it is I'm asked to draw. Now, sketching these functions is undoubtedly a given. I imagine more so in a sack than an exam, but you never know. I have seen exams ask you to sketch functions, so you need to be able to do that. My advice is to always, 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 always split it into composite uh, uh, transformations. 
So me, I would always, always in this situation draw a sine curve and I'm just talking out loud while I'm working it now. I've got to do things in the format of DRT. So dilation, well there's a dilation, that's the easiest one to do. So again, I do another quick sketch just so I don't confuse myself and three and minus three because that's the amplitude has now been multiplied by three. I've now got to deal with this one here. Right, well, I know that normally that's two pi. I know that that's pi and I know that that's zero. That means that my period now becomes 2 pi on 3. So I could now go straight to, if I was only drawing one of these, and you notice I've not given you any domain. So here, I know my period is 2 pi on 3. That would have to be half of that, which would be 2 pi on 6, which would be pi on 3. And this would be 0. I know that this value here, would fit halfway between zero and pi on three. So that's half of zero and pi on three, or well, half of that would be pi on six. And then I imagine that this would be five pi on six. Let's just check three, no, let's just check. Well, what's halfway between two pi on three and pi on three? Oh, don't know. So the easiest way to work out what's halfway between is add the two together. So two pi on three plus pi on three is three pi on three, which is pi, and then halve it. So that's gonna be pi on two. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, you have everything there that you need, barring the fact that I've had to put three and minus three. Now, if my domain had been obvious, I'd have had to put the terminals on the end, but that's one way of doing it. It's not actually the way I would always have done it, all right? But I suppose some people say, well, if you know the period, you can just work out the rest of the values. Me, I would have actually gone from here. And you're arguing, what do you mean me? You're doing the video. I know, chill. So there's pi on two, there's pi, there's three pi on two, and there's two pi. Now, because this three here means multiple everything by a third, I'd have then gone straight to multiplying everything by third, and I'd have done doop, I'd have gone uh, three, minus three, that stays the same. This was pi on two, times up by a third becomes pi on six. This was pi, so that becomes pi on three. This was uh, three pi on two, so that just becomes pi on two, and that becomes two pi on three. I personally think that's so much easier than trying to work out midpoints and midpoints, because you make silly mistakes, right? So again, Here's another example, and you can see the reference graphs here are there just to try and help you realize that this is what we're trying to get towards. So once again, dilations, reflections, translations. There is my three, there is a dilation, and there is a translation. So breaking it down, what does my normal sine graph look like? Well, there's a quick sketch of my sine graph, one and minus one. So I'm gonna deal with the vertical translation now. Sorry, a vertical dilation. So it's three and minus three. So that's that three dealt with. I have to do the other dilation, which now squidges it in by a third. So again, I'm gonna do my, that was pi on two. There is pi, there is three pi on two, and there is two pi. I'm gonna third everything, which means that that now becomes, let's make it slightly bigger. Uh, three and minus three, that stays a zero. So that now becomes pi on six. That becomes pi on three. That becomes pi on two. And that becomes two pi on three. So dealt with all my dilations. Now I have to do my translations. Plus pi on four means I'm actually gonna move it that way, pi on four. Now the number of people who will then go on and draw the graph like this but will state that that value there is minus pi and four terrifies me. You cannot do that. Remember, you've got to move the whole graph over. You've actually got to sketch it so that it's moved over as well. So, well, and up and all right, that's a horrible graph, but the general idea is that's gonna be at three, that's gonna be at minus three. This first point I can find out easily because it's minus pi on four. Why? Well, because I'm taking each of my values now, it was zero, and I'm gonna move it by pi on four and take away pi on four from each one of them. Okay, wow, how are we gonna do this? Well, I'm afraid each one you have to do individually. So that's pi on six minus pi on four. Make that out of 12, that becomes two pi minus three pi, which becomes minus pi on 12. So this value here really doesn't go through that axis there, all right, but it goes through um, minus pi on 12. 
This one here was pi on 3. So pi on 3 minus pi on 4. Again, make it 12. Gives you pi on 12. This value here uh, was 3 pi on 2. So 3 pi on 2 minus pi on 4 gives me 6 pi on 4. So 5 pi on 4. So this is now 5 pi on 4. And I know that this value here was 2 pi on 3. And I'm going to take away pi on 4, which gives me over 12, uh, 8 pi minus 3 pi, which gives me 5 pi on 12. So 5 pi on 12. So those are my crossing points. Thank you very much for my maximums and minimums. Now, what else would I need to find? In this situation here, I'd have to find out where that value crossed my x-axis. Looking at the actual graph, we see that this value here, not that I actually sketched it, was minus pi on 12. We would need to find that value there. Now, how do you find that value there? Well, what do you know? You know that x equals 0. Congratulations. You would put it into, and you would say that y was equal to 3 sine 3, 0 plus pi on 4. So 3 sine 3 pi on 4. Put that into your calculator and see what pops out as the value. And that would be your solution. So using this one now, we have cosine as my reference. There is cosine. Now we need to be very careful because we now know our crossing points are pi on 2, uh, pi, 3 pi on 2, and 2 pi. Right, so first things first. 2 is going to make it 2 and minus 2. This 3 is actually, oh, I'm so glad I chose 3 again because it's going to change all of these by a factor of one third. So, quick sketch of my standard cosine curve. So, what do we say is 2 and minus 2. Now, we know that this value here is pi on 6. This value here is pi on 3. This value here is pi on 2. And that value there is 2 pi on 3. All I've done is times all of those by a third or divided them by 3, whichever you feel is most appropriate. Now, that's what my dilation's done. Then we have to do reflections, which is minus 2. So, up here, quick sketch, is now going to do this. Because that minus sign reflects it in the x-axis, if you remember. Still 2 and minus 2. And the crossing points are still pi on 6, pi on 3, pi on 2 and 2 pi on 3. They're still the same. Now, we've got to do this minus pi on 3. So I'm going to move everything that way by pi on 3. Yep. La, this is awesome. Now, actually, yeah. So I'm now going to look at this and realize that my... I'm now going to look at this and realize that my graph is actually probably going to do something more like this. And we've just got to take all of those values and add on pi on 3. So the first thing first is that value there is going to be pi on 3. So my minimum is going to be pi on 3. This value here was pi on 6. I've got to add on the pi on 3, which is going to give me pi on 6 plus 2 pi on 6, which gives me 3 pi on 6, which is pi on 2. So that now becomes pi on 2. This maximum value was pi on 2. Sorry, that maximum value was pi on 3. I'm going to add on pi on 3, which gives me 2 pi on 3. And this value here came down at pi on 2, which I'm going to add to pi on 3, which gives me 5 pi on 6. And obviously you would keep going. We would need to put our terminals on if we had been told uh, our domain. And we would need to work out what this x-axis intercept is. But the ideas are exactly the same. Now, I'm not going to do the next two graphs because, firstly, this one here is a trick, remember? So you would rearrange that or you would refactorize it as sine 3x plus pi on 6. This would mean, very quickly, it would be the standard sine curve, 4 and minus 4 is my amplitude. That would be done. This factor of third would once again give that as... Uh, pi on 6, uh, pi on 3, pi on 2, and 2 pi on 3. That's that 3 done. And then you would take the whole graph, oops, not that way, and you would shift it pi on 6 that way. Finally, this example here. Yep, well, actually, as it turns out, is this one here. Yay, 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 yay. Yeah, all sucks. Right, ladies, gentlemen, lovely having you here. 
general ideas, as I've stated before, is just deconstruct these graphs so that you know what your dilations are, what your reflections are, and what your translations are, and break them down, sketching them bit by bit by bit. Thanks very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you. Thanks very much for joining us for that video. It was really good having you. Now, if you'd like to know when the next video is coming, why not click on subscribe? Alternatively, head on over to mathsguru.com where you can watch all of the videos on its own dedicated website. While otherwise, watch the video that's just popped up. It'll be part of this series. All right, take care. See you again soon.